In December of 1996, my parents, my sisters and I were in Durban, which is a city on the Indian Ocean coast of the country of South Africa. Now, early one morning, my dad was walking along a sidewalk, which is not far from the ocean, where there were parking spots along the road. And he saw that there were some security guards and some police that were, were milling around. And there'd clearly been some kind of commotion that had happened in the early hours of the morning. Now, car, car theft is a massive problem in South Africa, and our vehicle was parked there, so Dad walked over to see what was going on. Now, if you know your South African history, a huge part of the past 400 years revolves around racial clash, clashes between white, Dutch-descended settlers and the different black people groups that are indigenous to the area. Now, these racial tensions culminated in a white South African-ruled government system it was implemented starting in the 1940s that was called apartheid, which was an institutionalized system of racial segregation and oppression. Now you can see it to this day. When you approach South African cities, uh, there are sprawling shanty towns that are inhabited by black South Africans, sometimes in the millions, which surround the city itself. And the city itself is usually populated largely with white South Africans in gated, comfortable suburbs. Now, among many other things, the black majority of the country became incredibly poor throughout apartheid. And out of that desperation, crime levels skyrocketed. But after generations of unbelievable struggle, apartheid ended in 1994, and Nelson Mandela was elected president. So two years later, in this climate, in a city center, city center in Durban, my dad found this commotion along the road, and he approached the group. Now, a white security guard walked over and told my dad that they had just caught a pair of car thieves that were in the act. And what was interesting about these thieves was their boldness. Now, they were openly hanging out near the cars before breaking in and trying to drive off. Now, there's a reason for this boldness uh, that they had. And the security guard told my dad, and he said, you know, these thieves, they were white. And they counted on the fact that we wouldn't suspect them as they lingered around the cars the way that we would have suspected them if they'd been black. Now, because, I mean, they know that apartheid still lives in our hearts. Now, in this series that we're going through on emotionally healthy spirituality, you know, based on the book of the same name by Peter Scazzaro, a few weeks ago, Jeff Martins first taught that it's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature and that the vast majority of our emotional health actually lies below the surface, and it often remains undealt with. Now, this prevents us from being able to actually grow in spiritual maturity, despite our best surface-level efforts, and seemingly saying and doing, participating in the right things. Now, last week, Carrie Jones led us to understand how deeply our own identity, our true knowledge of ourselves, is intertwined with knowing God. And as we do the hard and important work to value who we are and what makes us tick. Now today, I'm gonna to talk about what that security guard, I mean really, those car thieves, what they understood. That we're carrying in the present what happened in the past. Now the sins of apartheid didn't go away when apartheid officially ended. You know, it lingers on to this day in the beliefs and behaviors of the people whose parents had perpetuated it. I mean, did you know that, I mean, the same is true for, for you and for me, for the patterns of belief and behavior that existed in our families of origin. And if we don't go back and understand that, then we will repeat the patterns of the past and we won't move forward towards the emotional and spiritual health that's actually available to us. Now, we don't usually perceive how much emotional baggage we're carrying from our past and how heavily it influences our perspective of the world around us, as well as our behaviors. Now, this is particularly shaped not just by our own past experiences, but in regards to our families of origin. When it comes to our families, I mean, we're just the tip of the iceberg that's sitting on a far greater mass of experiences and behaviors that the previous generations of our family lived through and passed on generation by generation. 
I mean, that mass is sitting below the surface of our perceptions of the world and our behaviors. Now, Peter, Spiz or Peter Scazzaro writes that family patterns from the past are played out in our present relationships without us necessarily being aware of it. And this recurrence of family patterns is true for all of us. Now, the collection of stories, records, histories, and poems that make up the first 39 books of the Bible, what we as Christians call the Old Testament, do a remarkable job of describing human behavior you know, in personal, uh, in relational, and group dynamics. Now, that's actually a significant part of their entire Holy Spirit-led purpose, showing us how God interacts with humans who behave with actually a surprising amount of consistency across the boundaries of time and culture. Now, as one example, the pattern of family behaviors, which are repeated generation after generation, is highlighted uh, in the lives of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, the very first generations that the scriptures show were invited into new relationship with God. So Abraham, his son Isaac, and then Isaac's son Jacob exhibited patterns of incredibly negative behavior that echo from one generation to the next. So Abraham lied multiple times about his wife Sarah. And then his son Isaac's marriage to Rebekah was also characterized by lies. Before Isaac's son Jacob uh, emerged as someone who consistently lied throughout his life. I mean, then Jacob actually had 10 sons who together lied about the death of their brother Joseph for a decade. And, and that was somewhat because their father Jacob had played favorites with Joseph, just like Jacob's father Isaac had played favorites with his brother Esau, which is just like Isaac's father Abraham had played favorites with his brother Ishmael. Now, there were different factors that played into these patterns being initiated in their stories. And it's not because Abraham was a uniquely terrible person. I mean, he was as flawed as the rest of us and a product of his culture, but he's considered a hero of the faith in the scriptures, along with Isaac and Jacob, and rightly so. Now, God is actually often referenced in light of him as the God of Abraham. Maybe you've heard that. And in fact, God uses that line himself, clearly not uneasy about being intimately identified with Abraham. Yet, Abraham is human. And the reality is that deeply unhealthy patterns were passed down, even from him, and through multiple generations after him. And it's that passing down of patterns of behavior that's key for us to note here. Now, there are a few places in the scriptures where it says a version of the fairly troubling line that God punishes the sin, or the children, for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now, this line is obviously located in its place in a Middle Eastern culture about 4,000 years ago. This wasn't written right now, but I think that we can see what some of what God means. And that built into the very nature of our created biological beings, and the things that we experience and that we do, I mean, they affect the next number of generations. Now, we're specifically affected by the three or four generations that came before us, who leave a deep, an often unconscious imprint on us. Now, my great-grandmother, my Oma, Anna, had one daughter named Elvira. Now, Grandma Elvira died when, when her daughter, my mom, Sharon, was young. So Oma stepped in to help raise my mom. And it was clear that Grandma Elvira had experienced a lot of trauma through manipulation by Oma. And my mom experienced that as well. And that's impacted her throughout her life. Now, Oma, Anna, now she'd escaped Russia during World War II. Uh, she experienced the disappearance of her husband who was abducted and never seen again. And she narrowly escaped with her infant daughter, you know, my grandma Elvira. And they had unimaginably traumatic experiences throughout the war before, I mean, ultimately, because of their own German-speaking background from generations before being rescued by the German army. I mean, that's right the German army in World War II. You know, like the bad guys in basically every story, led by Hitler and the Nazi party. I mean, they're actually a part of the story of rescue in my family's past. 
And you talk about like complicated family history. So Anna's trauma wasn't passed down in that exact same way to her daughter and to her daughter's daughter, but trauma was passed down, particularly through emotional manipulation that both Grandma Elvira and my mom heavily received. And despite this, my mom did an incredible job of giving me and my sisters an emotionally healthy upbringing. I mean, she actively worked to give us a different childhood than she had experienced. But it's been hard work uh, that my mom put in and continues to put in. And even despite this, I know that, I mean, there's still work that, that I need to do to not perpetuate some, some of the narratives and perceptions that came from Oma and from what Oma experienced. So for example, I mean, I often live with my own internal narrative of who I am and what I feel and that those things don't actually matter, that what I feel, think, or need doesn't matter. Uh, Oma's needs as a person were taken from her, but three generations later, should I really be leaning into that narrative and believing that? Is that what I would want for my children to believe about themselves? That wasn't fair for Oma, and it's not fair for my children. And I think that's the opposite of what Carrie was teaching us last week about our identities and the value inherent to our identities in Christ. And yet there it is. You know, unhealthy patterns to the third and fourth generation seem to be a reality in the creative, created order. However, the arc of scriptures always bends towards redemption. Now, the invitation to follow Jesus uh, and learn his ways is an invitation to put off the unhealthy patterns of our family of origin and relearn how to do life in the healthy patterns of God's family. Now, talking about his own family of origin, Jesus said, who are my mother and my brothers? He says, then he looked around those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. And the apostle Paul later expands on the same theme in his letter to the Roman church. You know, naming it in, in chapter eight of, of that book of the Bible that we get to choose to be adopted into the family of God. Now, Jesus isn't someone who disrespected or ignored his family. And among the 10 commandments is the instruction to honor your father and mother. And Jesus' life didn't end the importance of these commandments, but actually Jesus' life brought them into an even greater depth of meaning. In fact, one of the ways that we actually honor our parents is by not passing on patterns that were harmful for them as well. Now, because Jesus knew that our emotional and spiritual health depended on all of us, us and everyone in our families, being invited to draw nearer to the ways of the kingdom of God, not nearer to the patterns of our families. Now, I mean, there are good and healthy family patterns that are reflections of the kingdom of God. You know, whether or not we'd identify them in that way. But that's true in a lot of our families, and that's actually amazing. But not all of our family patterns are healthy, and mixed in together, we may not actually realize the subtle influences that are impacting us that are not healthy. And we don't recognize those, they can be harmful, especially when the invisible scripts of our family of origin are contrary to the message of Jesus, but are so deeply embedded that we can't tell the difference between the two. So, how do we identify those patterns in our own lives from our own families? So Peter Scazzaro, he gives a helpful framework to start with, which he calls the Ten Commandments of your family. Now, these are some of the fundamental building blocks which are of life and relationship about which our family of origin has passed down, you know, certain messaging that we now take for granted. Now, the invitation is to think about each one of these and what our family messages are about them. So here are the 10. He lists them as money, conflict, sex, grief and loss, expressing anger, family, relationships, attitudes towards different cultures, success, feelings, and emotions. Now, obviously, this isn't comprehensive. For example, you may want to add uh, parenting or uh, gender roles or marriage, singleness, physical affection, or others that are relevant to you. But this is a place to start. 
what are your family messages about these themes? For example, money. Maybe money is the best source of security or making lots of money proves that you've made it in life. Or money is evil and should be avoided. Or how about family? You owe your parents for all they've done for you. Or family is the most important thing. How about feelings and emotions? You know, there are certain feelings that you're not really supposed to have. Or your feelings are not that important. You know, we may receive messages that we don't necessarily know are contrary to the message of Jesus, to life in the family of God. But these are shaping our relationships right now. And we're passing down these messages to the next generations. And until we identify them and receive them and receive the invitation to change them, I mean, to be transformed like ourselves. The Ten Commandments of your family is a good exercise to start digging into this. You know, another is that you know, we can actually ask the people around us who love us the most. It's a hard question, but we can say, how do you experience me? You can invite them to be honest and get into things that they wish you knew about yourself because of how it impacts them or others. Now, as you hear this, you might be thinking, you know, it's not like that for me. You know, I had a really healthy upbringing and continue to have a great relationship with my parents and even my grandparents. This isn't necessarily a message for me. I mean, if that's you, uh, that's worth celebrating. It's worth thanking God for that gift. It's an amazing gift. I mean, I actually put myself in that category as well. I mean, with thankfulness. But it's still important to actually take a close look at what patterns are still present there that may not feel overt, but can keep us in cycles that God wants to free us from. I mean, some for ourselves, you know, maybe for the people around us, you know, both within our family and also beyond our family, including the most vulnerable people in the communities around us. So I mean, that white South African guard knew that generations of racism hadn't been eliminated, even though apartheid was officially over and Nelson Mandela was now the president. As he wisely understood, I mean, apartheid still lives in our hearts. Generational traumas, patterns, experiences, you know, they don't just go away because we think we've moved on. They don't just go away because I consciously you know, choose to follow Jesus or because I've been baptized or you know, I haven't missed church in years, I mean, other than COVID maybe. The patterns are imprinted on us. You know, even in the midst of real goodness in our lives and real followership of Jesus, you know, we have patterns of familial history you know, still living in our hearts. You know, still cycling through our actions, possibly even to a greater degree than our actions are actually being shaped by Jesus. But it actually doesn't have to be that way. If we can go and do the hard and honest work of going back, we can go forward. You know, in fact, the scriptures give uh, a poetically hopeful take on generational patterns. When in the book of Exodus, as we read earlier, it quotes God as saying that there's uh, punishment uh, for the children, for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generations. But it then actually carries on to say that God's greater attribute is showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You know, negative patterns extend to third and fourth generations. Right? They just do. We can see that. But love and everything that love does extends to a thousand generations. God's eager for us to break the cycles of unhealthy patterns that foster emotional immaturity. And God wants to shower us with relational blessing that will continue to increase generation by generation. And that's true whether you have biological children or not, because we've all received patterns and we all shape the next generations. Now, when Oma Anna escaped Russia. Another young woman who is similarly fleeing with young children from their uh, German-speaking Mennonite community in Russia was named Katerina. Uh, Katerina similarly got across the front lines and safe behind the German army. And the same as my Oma, uh, her and her young ones continued into Germany before getting on a ship and emigrating to Canada. Now both, uh, both of them actually ended up uh, here in the Niagara region and where they raised their children and where generations of their families thrived thanks to the sacrifices that they'd made and the hardships and the traumas that they had endured. 
Now I remember toward the end of Oma's life, visiting her at Pleasant Manor, her seniors community in Virgil. And uh, often we could hear Katrina right across the hall. Uh, it would be as her children, her grandchildren and great grandchildren would visit her as well. So we didn't know each other yet, but my wife, Taryn, was among those great grandchildren visiting Katrina, her Oma. Now, Anna and Katrina didn't get to find out that they would actually share the fifth generation from them uh, in our three boys. So Taryn and I are continuing to learn how to work through the family patterns that have been passed down through our families of origin. And we can see firsthand that within the three and four generations of unhealthy patterns, the thousand generations of love that God promises are actually present already as well. You know, I can see that in the hard work that my mom put in to pass on different healthy patterns to me and to my sisters. And Taryn and I want to be committed to that same work for ourselves and for the boys, uh, for the influence that we have over the next generations beyond our biological family, beyond our own sons, you know, for vulnerable people in our community, you know, for actually for the parents, our own parents and the generations that came before us, and for our relationship with Jesus, who invites us to experience our true identities with a clarity that's not clouded by unhealthy patterns. God is good and loving. God wants us to experience emotional maturity that leads to spiritual health. God encourages us to know ourselves and experience the joy that that brings. And God invites each one of us to look back into our families of origin in order to go forward together into the family of God.